over that stuff again and uh, maybe put a little bit different things in it. So tonight, I want to preach to you on uh, Get Your 1993 Summer Tune-Up. Um, as we go into the summer of this year, it's that time of year again, the easiest time of year to backslide. Um, this is the time of year when, if you're not real careful, you'll get out of church. You'll get out of God's will. There's something about it. Something about after a cold, dead winter, and everything pops out in the flowers, and it gets warm, and you you, know, you want a loafer, and instead of go to church, and you want to see the... Go to the mountains and they say, you know, they say some go to the mountains to see the scenery and some go to the beach to be the scenery. And if you ain't careful, if you ain't, amen, that's right. If you ain't careful, that's the best time in the world to get out of church. And I hope you won't do that tonight. Get tuned up. I am not a automobile mechanic. You didn't know that, did you? Now, um, we have some mechanics here in our church. People know Brother Dean back there. He's a, a number one expert mechanic. That's all there are to it. I mean, think about a car, he knows. Um, Wayne, these other fellas, a lot of them, I don't know how many in here do it for a living. Maybe three or four. I don't know, but these guys, they know cars. I don't. Now, I know a little bit, so don't you make fun of me if I make one of my applications wrong. I'm, I'm a preacher. And um, if you make fun of me talking about how to fix cars, I'll get you up here some Sunday and let you preach. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Uh, but uh, I don't know a whole lot about cars. I know when they're making a racket, keep driving them <laughs> till they die. <laughs> no, no, you haven't checked. I can check the oil. I can check the gas. I can check the transmission fluid and Stuff like that, as far as anything beyond that, I never have a fool with one. Um, but I am going to mention some things tonight that I do know a little bit that you've got to have. You've got to have on your car if you're going to go through a, a journey, go somewhere. And we're headed into the summer of 1993. Don't you think, don't you think the devil's got right and he's going to let up on us this summer? Don't even think it, brother. Don't think, well, it's so bad last year, it couldn't be no worse. Don't think that. You are going to be hit in 1993 harder than you've ever been hit before. All right, now I need all you mamas with these babies to help me, please. It was very hard to preach this morning. And as a matter of fact, somebody even mentioned it, that it was so distracting. So I hope that you'll... Uh, Hope that you'll uh, help us out with these babies so everybody can hear, especially my voice and the shape it's in. Psalm 26, verse number 2. Psalm 26, verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. I like that word, examine me. Look me over and check me out. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll wait just a minute. Verse 5. See it? Look at verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Here the Lord said, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Then the word reprobate means void of judgment. You're not even able to tell right from wrong anymore when you have a reprobate mind. And he said, the Lord's in you, except unless you're a reprobate or something. He's in your heart, so examine yourself. Examine yourself. Check yourself out. What I want you to do tonight is pull your spiritual self into God's garage. We need to get our 93 inspection stickers and make sure we're ready to run for the Lord Jesus Christ this year. 
Summertime is a dangerous time. You, you have this feeling of, oh boy, the weather's nice. Let's just kind of just lay back and take it easy. Plant the gardens. Ride and see the mountains. Ain't nothing wrong with all them things. But the devil, uh, if you're not careful, he'll cool you off spiritually. I've noticed, as a general rule, the church always does better in the fall than it does the spring. I I begin to notice that as the years go by. Attendance-wise, everything, there's something about fall that does better, and something about spring, churches usually do worse. Uh, I don't know why, I guess, I guess, um, I guess you want to go out and go wild when it gets warm. By winter, you're backslid and got to come crawling back to God again. You ain't got no money to go nowhere. I don't know. But uh, I tell you what, when it gets this time of year, it gets this way. Now I want to talk about your car tonight and compare that to you. The first thing I want to say tonight is, as we face the summer of 1982, we need our battery charged. I don't care how good a shape everything else is in in your car. If your battery's dead, you ain't going nowhere. And it's what starts it. That's what kicks the thing off and gets it going. You can take a brand new car, and if the battery's dead, you don't go anywhere. And a Christian is the same way. You need your spiritual battery charged every now and then. You need just a good charging. That's why we have this youth rally in the spring. That's why Bibles. That's what's going out at Zion Hill this week, last week. You're getting your battery charged. Now, I've, I've had that problem many times, and I'm sure you have. I'll never forget back in that bad, bad winter of 1977, the year we started our church. That was about the worst weather we'd had in about a hundred years. And buddy, if you had a sorry battery, it'd show up on you. You know, if you got a bad battery in your car, you know the day it don't start, don't you? On the coldest morning, that's when she's going to go. She's going to go dead on you. That's when she's going to go. A lot of people got a weak battery spiritually, but you can't tell it until you hit a cold spot in their life or the church goes into a valley or we had a cold spot, then they're, they're, they're dead. Now, what we have here on Sundays, we have battery charging. I remember one time my battery was dead, and I took it to a service station up and down. It might have been right here where a bookstore is, a long time ago. And I said, uh, man, I, my battery's dead. I need this thing charged up. Have you ever had a dead battery? You always have to, you have to remember now when you're uptown and everywhere, you got to park on a hill. So you can put it in second gear and roll it off, and if you got automatic, you better leave it running while you're while you're in the store. And you 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 uh, you set that thing out there. And I remember I told them I said I want my battery charged. And they said, Well, which kind you want? And I said, What do you mean, which kind I want? I just want my battery charged. They said, Well, we got two ways of charging batteries. They said we can put it on what we call the, the hot charge. We can hook you up to a little old thing here, and by the hour you can come back and it'll get your battery going for you. They said, Now if you really want that thing charged, you need to put it on the slow charge. And I said, what's a slow charge? They said, that means you leave it hooked up all night long. And buddy, by tomorrow, when you come back, your battery will be in good, good shape. They said, it would do it a whole lot better if I put it on that slow charge. Well, I forget which one I used then, but I've thought a lot about that. And I thought, you know something, we're living in a day when Christians are so busy that very few of us take time to really get our battery charged for God Almighty. Brother, you can do a lot more for God on a bus route or on a Sunday school class or singing or preaching or teaching if your, your batteries is charged. You can tell when somebody's batteries is charged just by being around them. They got their own energy. It's coming out of them. It ain't getting it from nobody else. It's bubbling up out of inside like a generator on the inside. There's been a lot of Christians, and I've done the same thing. I've said, boy, Lord, I've, I've got a lot to do, but Lord, I need my battery charge. Put me on the hot charge, Lord. And I get down for about 15 minutes. Oh, Lord, fire me up. Oh, Lord, fire me up. Oh, Lord, fire me up. Oh, Lord. And I beg the Lord there. I goes, boy, I've got to go. I've got to hurry. I can go pretty good off a little old charge like that. But you know something? If I really want to get it done right. 
I really want to get it done right, I'll say, boy, hook her up there and leave her overnight. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do is get hooked up and leave that thing overnight. That's why we have all night prayer meeting. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ prayed all night in the Bible. He got Himself on slow charge. Let me tell you something tonight, friend. There are things that happen in a Christian life. There are things that happen in a church's life. There are things that happen in anybody's life that you will never be able to handle unless you learn how to get in touch with God and spend time in prayer. I preached on prayer last Sunday night, so I'll not take a, a big long time on this. But I believe, brother, we ought to crawl in here and pray. There were some men up here and some ladies up here to pray last night. We have prayer meetings on Saturday night. But it, it, it disappoints me when many of you never even, you never even care, evidently enough, to come and lay around on the altar a little while and pray. You say, preacher, I pray at home. Yeah, I know. I understand. I'm not fussing at you. I do too. But it'd be good, boy. It'd be good if people just come and lay around on the altar and say, Oh, God! Oh, God! Would you pour out your blessing? There's something that God does for you when you spend time hooked up to the slow charge that you can't get done no other way in your life. A lot of people come in on Sunday morning and here's the way they come in. They leave here on Sunday night with a Bible under the arm, you know, and they're saying, God will make this trial of us in. <laughs> Next Sunday morning they come in like this. Brother Danny, can you help me? I've had them tell me, they said, preach to me, brother. Preach to me. I need, you know what they remind me of? They remind me there are people that their batteries run dead and they call me up and said, preacher, can you jump me off? Now, I'll tell you what, boy, I've jumped people off a lot of times. I've been jumped off a lot of times, ain't you? When they hook the jumper cables up to you. That's what I'm trying to do to you tonight. I'm going to hook the jumper cables up to your heart and try to hit it with a spark or two and see if I can't jump you off and get you going. But you're, you're going to have to have more than that to run the next Sunday. You're going to have to have more than that to face the summer of 1993. On the journey on the long haul, you're going to have to have more than me jumping you off on Sunday night to keep you going till next week. You're going to have to spend some time. You're going to have to turn that television off a little while. You're going to have to lay that magazine down a little while. You're going to have to let something go and get plugged into God and spend time in prayer with the Lord. That's all there to it. Amen? Now I know that our flesh hates that, but that's the truth. There is no other way that we can have the power of God on our church like God wants it to be unless we spend time getting plugged in. The average Christian's life is a prayer life is a sham. The average Christian's prayer life is a dishonor to God Almighty. I'll tell you, it would embarrass us tonight if we let everybody in here stand up and tell how long you prayed today. It would embarrass us. It really would. But I'm telling you what the Lord said our example. He spent a night many times in prayer to God. I mean, I remember back in the old building, we've done it down here too. I remember uh, them boys got on fire there for a little while. Brother Dale Cable, Brother Ricky Bowling, some of them, they got to having all night prayer meetings. They'd come up there, boy, and they'd, one of them would bring a thermos jug full of coffee like that, and boy, they'd get down there and we'd pray. And I remember a bunch of us, it'd be 10 or 15 of us sometime, we'd get down there and we'd talk, we'd say, boys, the world's in bad shape. We'd talk about politics, we'd talk about everything, we'd say, let's pray. We'd get down and we'd pray about 45 minutes or an hour, I mean, just come up sweet sweating nearly. We just say, oh God, oh God, we need you. Oh God, get a hold of our youth choir, our boys and girls, our Sunday school teachers, our bus drivers, our workers. Oh God, be here in the service in such power that people won't be able to walk out without getting saved. We get through praying a little while. They go back there and stand around, drink a cup of coffee, talk, we'd laugh a little bit. It'd be about one or two o'clock in the morning. We'd say, hey boys, let's go in there and get at it again. We'd go in there sometimes, we'd go home at two o'clock. Sometimes we'd 
would go home at 3 o'clock. Sometimes they'd see the sun come up there before they ever left up there in the old building. And I'm talking about not on a day off, have to go into work on Saturday morning and go through a regular... You say, well, preacher, I just can't do that. I tell you what, there's probably a half of us in here that stayed up all night doing something for the devil or something for the prayer. Hey, some of you people right here probably stayed up till 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock last night, but you can't stay up till 11 o'clock and get on your knees and ask God to bless the services. We need to get our battery charged. Boy, I tell you, did you hear about that one fellow? His prayer life got so bad off that he just made him a great big old prayer on a big old big piece of cardboard like that, and he wrote out his prayer, tacked it up on his ceiling. Every night, right before he went to bed, he just lay down like that and point at it, and fall off to sleep. That was it. That was all the praying he done. And if you're like me, the first few minutes you pray, you can't even get your concentration out. When I first start praying, it's like I say, oh God, and then I think about everything I need to be doing and everything I ain't got done and phone calls I need to make and everything else. Funny how you don't think about all that stuff while you're watching TV. But boy, when you start praying, you think of 10,000 things you ought to be doing, right? Don't, Don't you suddenly get industrious. Don't you suddenly get thrifty when it comes time to pray. Well, I forgot. I, well, well, thank the Lord. I'll talk to you later. And boy, you'll be going off and, uh, uh, and, and hyper time. A lot of times you'll pray. I've heard of people praying, praying the dumbest things in the world. I've, I've, heard, pe- I've heard people praying. And you know, sometimes when you're hyper asleep, you don't even know what you're saying. And I've done that a lot of times. Your heart's right. I believe the Lord accepts that. And the Lord blesses you. But sometimes we just rattle off a bunch of stuff and we don't even know what we're saying when we pray. I've heard people pray that God would get saved. <laughs> I've heard people, oh God, oh God, I pray you'd get saved. Uh, you know, not even know what they're saying. That ain't praying. I mean, it was you, Brother Lou. You did that one time, didn't you? About me. <laughs> you was the one praying for me. Oh yeah, that's right. He, Lou was praying for me one time. He said, Lord bless Brother Danny. Praise his holy name. <laughs> that's some praying, ain't it? They told me about this little boy. Who was it? Shirley told me about that little boy over at the daycare the other day. They said he was a little bitty boy and he was going to lead him in prayer. And he got down and he talked real deep and he said, God is great. God is good. If he hollers, let him go. Oh, I messed up. <laughs> That's about like our praying sometimes. That's about like our praying. That's some praying, ain't it? Lord have mercy. You know them little kids, they might have, one little boy they said over at the school the other day, they, they was learning about teeth, start cleaning your teeth or something. They said, anybody know something about teeth? And he said, I do. Teeth and wide. Teeth and wide. That's right. But I want to tell you what, brother, that ain't that ain't much a way to pray. My soul, we need to get our battery charged. And I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you. You know what? I can't make you care. I can't. I, if I could, I would. I can't make you care. And if you care, if you care, you'll spend some time in prayer. The reason you won't pray is because you don't care. You think automatically the youth rally is going to be great. You think it always has been? Why well, won't it this time? I'll tell you why. Because the devil's fighting it harder than he ever has before. And if God's people don't pray, we'll not have the power of God. That's why. It don't just happen. Two, you got to get your spark plugs checked. You can't, you now spark plugs is like good services you go to. Brother John told me he's been, he's going to be planning on going over to camp meeting this week at, uh, Bristol, Tennessee. Brother Potter's over there. They're having camp meeting. He said, boy, I want to go over there and get fired up. He's going to go over there and get, get his spark plugs uh, all changed and battery charged. And he's liable to be dangerous when he comes back in here next Sunday morning. Amen. That'd be good. Amen. Praise the Lord. I thank God for a person that knows when they need a good tune-up. Okay. You know what? If your car is like most cars... You can't really tell it needs a tune-up till it's way, way. I remember one time, it was back, I, I forget which car I had. I think it was one of them little cars I had a long time ago, 10 years ago. And I got the 
I drove it so long, so many thousand miles, that it started losing power a little at a time, and I didn't realize it was losing power. And I was preaching revival somewhere over Nashville when I was driving up a mountain every night. And I got to noticing going up that mountain that it was changing gears, you know, and everything. I thought, well, I'm this thing going awful slow. And this car is pacing me. I can't stand somebody pace me. I think I'm doing something wrong here. People's pacing me. I, I need to be, I'm loafing. And, uh, do you feel like that on the interstate? You know, you look up and everybody's passing you. You're trying to do speed limit and everybody's passing you. You go through Atlanta, Orlando, somewhere like that. You do the speed limit, son, they'll run over you. You got to just go with the flow, boy. I just go down through there. And I remember I kept getting slower and slower and slower. You know, it makes you wonder when tractor and trailers start passing you. Going to, hey, buddy, if a church bus passes you, you better you get out and walk. And I mean, old slow rigs was coming up through there, keeping up with me like that. And I thought, well, there's something wrong. There must be something wrong with my car. So I took the mechanic. I said, uh, my car seems like it's weak. It ain't got the power that it ought to have. And boy, he, ch- he said, when's the last time you had them spark plugs changed? I said, I don't know. It's been a while. I, I thought I was doing all right. I was well, no, no fool with it. And he said, he said, no, no, them spark plugs is ruined. He put a set of plugs in that thing, and you wouldn't believe the difference. I mean, just, but he'd zoom up out, had all kinds, just a little four-cylinder car. That thing would move then. It would move. You know what? I didn't realize it. It lost power so gradually. See, if you had all kinds of power one day, and then half that the next day, You'd know something was bad wrong. But you lose it so gradually that one day one day you try to give out a track and you can't even hardly. And you think, I'm getting weak. I remember a year ago, it didn't bother me a bit to give out a track or or, or witness somebody or something. You know what you need? You need spark plugs, man. You know what spark plugs are? Good fired up services. Sunday morning preaching, Sunday night preaching, revival night preaching. I tell you, some of these, some of these folks went with me to revival last week. I appreciate people that want to do that. That shows a hunger that people have to hear the Word of God. Go out and hear somebody preach. Sit down and say, hey, fire me up, preacher. Set me on fire. Get me fired up in the work of the Lord. Then I'll tell you another thing you got to have is the timing right. I don't understand that. Don't ask me to explain it. I can't. But I know one thing. They say you got to have a timing set in a car. you got to have it set right in a Christian life. And if your time is messed up, Prayer time, Bible time, you'll just, you'll just get, you'll just be spinning your wheels and not getting nowhere. Now, is this true, Brother Dean? When a car is not out of time, it misses. Is that right? How many of you know what a car means when they say it's missing? It means you'll be going, Have you ever, boy, you give it to gas and you're really going there for a second and then it just quit. And then there it goes again. Like that. And it starts going out. Something's wrong with it there somewhere. That's a perfect picture of some of our Christian people. You go real good. You'll You'll go Sunday morning, Sunday night, miss Wednesday. You'll go Wednesday night, Sunday morning, miss Sunday night. Some of you's missing so bad right now, you're wasting half of your gas. You're missing bad. You're missing church services. You're missing Bible reading. You're missing prayer time. You gotta get that thing at time and set. Now what I mean by that is, you have to have time along, you have to have time set aside for God. Are you listening? When it gets ten o'clock, Next Sunday morning, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. I don't care how beautiful a day it is. I don't care if the dogwoods are in bloom on the parkway. I don't care if the flowers are up everywhere. It is not dogwood time. It is not picnic time. It is Sunday school time. You understand that? I'm trying to help you tonight. People say, well, I tell you what, preacher, we've been cooked up all winter and we're, we're gonna, we're going up on Mount Mitchell and worship God in nature. 
Yeah, I bet you will. I, I know a lot of them people that worship God on the river bank, pulling them trout in. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yeah. You say, are you against trout fishing? On Sunday morning, Sunday night, I am. Amen. You're supposed to be in church on Sunday morning, Sunday night. We have special services. It's church time. If I could ever get that through some of you people's head, God would bless you. You know what your problem is? You know what your problem is? You think God's not looking. He's not paying attention to what I'm doing. That's your problem. He is. He's marking it down. He knows. Buddy, they told me a long, long time ago, they said, just when you join the church, you're supposed to be there. I said, Amen. I'll be there. Lord willing, I'll be there. By the grace of God, I've been trying to do that all these years. I'm not talking about just because I'm a preacher either. If I'm, before I was a preacher, I tried to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You need your timing set. You get better guys mileage you have a smoother ride and all that if your timing's right if you want to smooth some of you you got so many rough places in your life it's because you don't use your time right well set a time to read your bible set a time to go to sunday school i believe if you go on vacation this year you only have one week a year off and you take a vacation. I don't blame you. As long as you go try to honor God, go to church somewhere while you're gone. Take your family to church. Listen, people. There's nothing in your life more important than your soul. Nothing. Not a ball game. I heard there's going to be one tomorrow night. Has anybody heard about that? I don't know who it is. Some old group playing some other old group. You say, preacher, this might be Dean's last chance. Yeah, it might be Dean's last chance. I agree with that. He's getting on up there. And just so you won't get mad at me, if we're playing somebody else in another state, I'm from North Carolina if we're playing another state. But I can't. I mean, i got to preach tomorrow night. And I want to tell you something. I mean, I like ball games good as anybody. I don't like college that good because them boys ain't, they just ain't got it like them pros do. The only thing that makes college basketball as exciting is the fans. The pros know how to play. You didn't like that, did you? <laughs> that's true. The fans is what makes you get into that, but them fans, they tear it up. And that's what, that's what makes church services good to congregation. If the congregation, hey man, hallelujah, get into it, other people enjoy it. It, make, it makes it better. And what was I saying? Oh yeah, I gotta preach tomorrow night. That's my place. That's where God wants me. I enjoy seeing a ball game too. And there's nothing wrong with it. But I'm just saying when it's church time, it's church time. And it ain't no other time. Church time. Then you got to have headlights. It's going to be dark this year, people. Sometimes the moon shines so bright you can drive without headlights. But not very often. Moon's a picture of the church in the Bible. Sometimes the church is shining so bright you don't have to have much light. You can just walk with the church. But that don't happen too often. Don't happen too often. You'll hit something. you got to have headlights on your car. The Lord said, "My the Word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know what you got on your car? You got your high beam and your low beam. Now when you put it on low, you can see right in front of you. You're going down the road, right there. But then if you want to see way up there what's ahead of you, pop that little button, put that thing on bright, you can see way out yonder in front of you. That's a picture of the Word of God. You want to just know what you're supposed to do today? Thy Word is a lamp under my feet. It tells you every little step to make. You want to know what you got to do on out in the future? Pop that beam on and it is a light under my path. There's your low beam. There's your high beam. You need to keep them lights burning. Have you ever, have you ever forgot to turn your lights on? Maybe when it's raining out here 
and you take off, you know, and you don't know your lights ain't on because the street's wet and the street lights are shining. I'll tell you what, son, when you go down past the last, past Greasy Corner down there and past the store, suddenly it's going to hit you, your lights ain't on. I promise you. It gets dark. And that's what a lot of people think. Well, praise God, I'm all right. Woo, glory to God. You're just rubbing it off everybody else in here. You get out there by yourself, out there in that world, you got to have some light projected out of yourself or you're going to stumble and fall. Amen? Sometimes you, sometimes you don't have your lights on and somebody will flash theirs at you. You ever had that done to you? Kind of makes you feel like an idiot, don't it? Somebody flashes a light. Turn your lights on, dumb head. You know, and you, you say, I knew this off. I was trying to save my battery. <laughs> you know, and you really didn't know. That's what I'm doing to you tonight. I'm flashing. Flashing my lights at you. Telling you to turn it on. It's dark out there, people. It's dark. It's foggy spiritually. Remember one night I was coming down the mountain. I was preaching way up in Burnsville or somewhere. And I had this boy with me, and he grew up in Texas and Florida, and he wasn't used to mountains. And I'd been, I'd been scaring him all evening. You know, going up, that's a bad, that Cox's Creek up through there. And it got real foggy that night. Real foggy. He was scared to death. I was coming, I know that, that road pretty good, you know. I was coming down through there, and he said, Whew. I don't see how you see. He said, I, said, I can't see, I can't see. And I always tell people, I said, it don't, it don't matter if you can see. I'm driving. As long as I can see, that's all that matters. It'd be better off for you not seeing me to see than me not seeing you to see. I've heard, I've seen people with me, you know, and it's getting real bad and everything. And they'll start saying, boy, I can't see. Well, forget your side, man. Wipe this side off. <laughs> the other man's got to see the one driving. And did you know, he kept getting more scared and scared. He said, I can't see, I can't see. And just as we started down the mountain, it was so foggy on us. It was, but you couldn't see far from here that, that, that wall in front of you. And the only way I knew where I was going is I seen the white. I could see the white line. And I was just going right by that white line. Every time he'd turn, I'd turn. And I thought, I saw, boy, I know this road. And I was really trying to scare him. Right? And all of a sudden, I couldn't see the white line and everything. I kept going, kept going. I thought, whoa! And all of a sudden, I just seen a bunch of weeds. <laughs> all is just weeds in front of my headlight. He said, what you doing, you crazy thing? And I said, oh, got off our little... We had to back up and get back on the... Then you got to have your brakes checked. What does brakes... What are you supposed to use brakes for? Stop. Stop at a stop sign. Stop to avoid an accident. Stop to avoid... There are times when you're driving, you've got to know how, you've got to know when to stop. Now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight... There are things you can do this spring and summer. There are places you can go that the Bible does not say is a sin. That the Bible does not have anything specifically to say about it. You know, picnic and camping, playing ball, golf, swimming, whatever, horseback riding, whatever your activities are, whatever. The Bible don't say that's wrong, but I'll tell you what you better do. You better know where to stop. You better know when to put the brakes on. And if you'll listen, there'll be a little voice inside you say, all right, that's enough. Time to quit now. Spend some time with God. Slow her down, boy. You're getting too involved in this. If you're a Christian, the Lord is supposed to have first place in your life, and you can tell when you're getting over-involved. It always scares me and bothers me when Christians in our church start getting involved in a bunch of other things, and even good things. And I'm not against them, and I don't want you to take me wrong, but any kind of anything, this, this uh, weight loss thing, this aerobic thing, this anything, there's nothing wrong with all that stuff. Some people need to do that. But all I'm saying is, you've got to know when to stop. Because if you ain't careful, that becomes your religion and your God. And then you ain't doing nothing for God no more. Your whole life just wrapped up in that stuff. You can't spend your time in anything more important than living for the Lord. You got to know when to stop. 
You say, them bathing suits is bad last year, preacher. Yeah, and they'll be worse this year, too. You say, them beer commercials look mighty good, preacher. Yep, and they're going to be worse this year. They spend more money on them, make them look more tempting. You better know where to put the brakes on and say, no more, I don't trust myself. I'm not even going to let myself be around that. Then you got to have good tires. I'll hurry along here. That's your feet. Put some rubber on them things. I just, I run my tires till you can see the steel showing through them. Get the good out of them. I've wore out, I think I'm on my fifth set. Besides one that come on my car right now. Some, I just had a set on, put on there the other day. I don't know how come they wear out so fast. Sorry things. <laughs> they ought to make tires good. But, and once one of them things start getting lead, uh, start getting slicker and slicker and slicker, and they get, they, the way I always know when I need tires, I can tell when it's raining. When you're raining, you're going down the road, and all of a sudden, you, the front end starts doing like here. I say, oh no, it's time to get tires. I put them new tires, my car was doing that here a while back in all that rain. I said, man, I got to have some tires. I went and got some tires put on there, and it quit that just like that. Need something that'll grip. That's your gospel shoes. Don't let the steel belt be showing through your gospel shoes, brother. Uh, get out there and tell the gospel. Get, be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Then your carburetor. Your idling. Heart. That's your heart. Tune your heart. They say whisper a prayer in the morning. Whisper a prayer at noon. Whisper a prayer in the evening. Keep your heart in tune. Go on picnics, go hunting, plant your garden, do all that stuff, but keep your heart in tune with God. Then they say you got to check your radiator to make sure it ain't leaking. Check, make sure that you ain't got no leakage in your life. Or they'll be running hot and blow up on you. Then you got to have windshield wipers. When the storms of life come, to push it out of your eye and face so you can see. Then you got to have your front end lined up. I just took Carrie's car here the other day. I hear this fellow up here on 221 that does front end alignment up to Woodlawn. I said, hey, something. I said, this car, something, something's wrong. And because, you know, you're going down the road like this and you have to turn this way all the time. <laughs> and it was wanting to go this way all the time. He said, well, you need front end line. I said, put her on there and check it out. And on that thing, they have to have both ends lined up. And he kept talking about the toe end. I don't know what the toe end is. He said, we're going to turn the toe in. I said, well, turn the toe in or turn the toe out or whatever. Just make it, make it straight. Turn the toe straight. And uh, he said, well, we'll do that. And they did it. And buddy, I'd you take that thing down the road there and just let go of the wheel and it'd go right straight down the road. Now, what some of you are doing in your Christian life is it's pulling on you. It's the hardest thing in the world for you to stay straight. You're always over here like this somewhere. I tell you what's really wild, when you're out of whack so bad, we was talking about the other night where you where your back end ain't falling in the front end. <laughs> Boy, that's a wild sight, you know what? I always think of that old bus they used to have down there at east side. That was the funniest thing. That old bus is one of them old long blue ones. That thing was out of whack bad, man. Bad. The back, the front tires be like this. The back tires over here like this. He'd be going down the road like this. It looked so funny. It looked like it was turning a curve all the time. I thought that bound to be bad on them tires, that thing, are going sideways like that. Trying to pass yourself. That's, and that's what some, that's why some of you people here, you need your front end lined up. Now you know what that fella did when he lined that front end up on her car? You know what he did? I could have got down there and said, well, it looks alright to me. He put on that machine, ripped it up. He could have got down there and said, turn it that way a little bit, buddy. Turn it that way. Well, that looks about right. He didn't do that, you know, because that's just his opinion. You know what that fellow done? 
I sat over there and watched him. I got me a drink out of the machine, sat down over and started reading my Bible and watched him. You know what he done? He pulled out a book. He sure did. He pulled out a book and he looked it up. 1986 Toyota Celica. Right here it is. Da 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 da. And he said, the book is going to tell us how that front end's supposed to be. It may look off to us and it may look not off to us. We're going to do what the book says to make it go straight. And I want to tell you tonight, everybody's got their opinion on how people should live. Everybody's got their opinion on right and wrong. You want me to tell you how to run a straight course? Go buy this book. This book is always right. This book is always right. It's always right. In every situation, you'll never go wrong by ordering your steps by this book right here. You're like that. You're, some people like that girl I seen the other day. This must be a style or something. Have you, is it a style now to wear two or three watches? That's a weird thing, buddy. I seen a girl the other day had two watches on. Oh, what, what in the world you got two watches on for? One of them ain't no good? Why'd you wire in it? I guess that must be a fad or something. She had two watches on. Now, if you got two watches on, one of them say 5 o'clock and one of them say 20 after 5, which one's right? You're like Curly on the Three Stooges. He used to pull his shirt up and he'd have a bunch of watches there. And he'd say, uh, well, this one's five minutes fast every two hours. This one's ten minutes slow every three hours. This one's, uh, loses one minute every six hours. And Mo would be scratching his head like that and he'd say, well, wh what time is it? And he pulled out a pocket watch over here and he said, three o'clock. <laughs> Everybody's got their opinion. Well, I believe you ought to do that. I believe you ought to do that. I believe you ought to do that. How do we know what's really right? Pull it out. Three o'clock. That's what time it is right there. Then you need to be lubricated. You got to have oil. Five quarts oil, four quarts oil, four and a half quarts oil. That's what mine holds. Yours might hold more than that. You got to have that stuff. They say you can drive one without gas and it won't hurt it, but you better not drive it without oil. <laughs> Thou anointest my head with oil. My old van, I keep my car, I try to keep my car changed on a regular basis, but used to when I had that old car, you know, you just, you hate, you just don't have a, a heart when you got an old clunker to change your oil regular. I feel like a waste of money. I feel like it ain't going to help it, it's bore out anyway. And I never did change oil in that thing very often. I figured, I figured I added enough for it to be changing itself. And I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm changing it all the time, don't ever have to change it. Yeah, yeah, it's going, going somewhere. And uh, I never would put no oil in that thing. And I'd hear it start clicking. And I'd hear it start going tick, 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 tick. And that's the way when I know it needed oil. I mean, uh, uh, you couldn't check it. That thing was so long. You pulled out and it didn't. You, you know, it's so long, wound around through there. You couldn't, you couldn't tell nothing on that thing. You wiped it out, stuck it down off, and stuck it back down in there. Pulled it out. It, it was so messed up you couldn't tell where you all was. And so I'd just drive it till it started clicking. And I'd stop and I'd anoint that thing with a quart of oil. Sometimes it still wouldn't quit clicking. After a quart of oil, I'd put another one in it. It quit clicking. It'd hush up. And I'd say, okay, let's go. We'd go for about another a month or so. Then I'd have to do that again. But I'm going to tell you something tonight, friend. To have a church like we've got here, we've got to be anointed with oil. There's no way all this many people can get along with each other. We'll kill each other if we're not lubricated, brother. You know what that does? It makes you just slide off each other. Boom, boom. You get that engine in there and it ain't got no oil in it, it just grinds it up. It just, the friction, you can't stand it. You know what churches need tonight? I've heard people say, wonder why they have so much problems with their church. Always splitting, having a split every six months. I'll tell you what's wrong. They need a grease job. They need the Holy Ghost in it. The Holy Ghost will make you easy to get along with. You hear me? These self-righteous people that never do anything wrong, can't get along with nobody, they ain't a bit more filled with the Holy Ghost than this pulpit is. 
The Holy Ghost will make you easy to get along with. Holy Ghost don't make you a self-righteous grouch. The Holy Ghost will... You'll have all kinds of convictions, but you'll be sweet about it. Then you got to have the air condition on. That's, I mean, you don't have to, but it's nice to have. Keep cool. Don't lose it. And the last thing you got to do, after you've had your car all checked out and everything's ready... You get on the right road and floor it for God. You ain't going to do no good to have your car all tuned up and everything if you're going the wrong way. Get on the right road. Get with what God's doing. The right road right now for us is prayer, putting out these things, praying for the youth. That's the way we're going right now. That's where our church is going. Get on the right road and just floor it. Let me tell you something. This ain't no time to be quitting on God. This ain't no time. Now, you'll be tempted to. There'll be a voice speak to you and say, your work is about through. Let somebody else have your job. If you ain't careful, if you ain't careful, the devil will knock you out of God's will. One thing at a time, little by little. What some of you need to do tonight is get your tune up. Put the Lord first in your life. Let's stand by our hands. How about search me, O God, Brother John, know my heart today. Maybe you need to come tonight and say, Lord, I just want a tune-up. Put me back in line. Fire me up. Charge my battery. I want to really get fired up for this youth weekend's coming up, Easter Sunday. I want to see souls saved. I want God to really do something in my life. Father, do what ought to be done tonight. Lord, as we pull into your garage, I pray that you'd tune up our church. Let it be what you want it to be. We'll praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 460. All right, we're going to sing number 465. Everybody, if you need to come, join these on the altar. Something's coming. You come on right now. Now, while we're getting ready to sing that next verse, if you did not get one of these personal prayer lists last week, we run out, I think, or you maybe you weren't here. This is our personal prayer and visitation list for the youth rally. People that you're going to try to get to come to the youth rally, raise your hand. These fellows will give you one right quick. Somebody help him here. Two or three of you boys help him out here. Take off back to you. Under. Raise your hand real high. And they'll give you one of these, okay? If you did not get one last week, if you did not get one last week, raise your hand high and they'll give you one. Amen. Brother Jason.